Amen. Good evening. We started uh, last week looking at the topic, Your God is Too Small, which is a title I've borrowed from a book by J.B. Phillips. But for me, the God I'm talking about is Jesus. And as I said last week, I have come to the conclusion over the last two or three years that my perspective on Jesus understates his divinity. And uh, it's something I've actually felt quite uncomfortable with because it seemed uh, blasphemous. So rather than tell you what you should think about Jesus, I thought what I'll do is over four classes, I'll look at different aspects of Jesus' divinity and, uh, and you can make up your own mind. So last week we looked at Jesus the Logos or the Word whereby John applied uh, a Jewish principle using the term Logos to describe the creative power of Jehovah and uh, John applies that to Jesus. So the ultimate symbol of power, of power and authority, just speaking the cosmos into existence and John uses that to describe Jesus. Uh, and as I said, I felt uncomfortable having this sort of more elevated view of Jesus' divinity. So I look at John, a Jew, and think how certain he must have been in conviction about this if he's willing to put this in a gospel, not just think it in his own head, but put this in a gospel to, uh, to proclaim to all believers. Right. So today, we're going to look at uh, Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. So we'll start in... Uh, Matthew chapter 1, picking it up in verse 21, this is where an angel is speaking to Joseph about the forthcoming birth, and uh, he quotes from Isaiah 7. So Matthew 1, 21. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfil what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So what then is the significance of this name? What, what is meant by God with us? But if we go to the penultimate chapter of the Bible, Revelation 21, in verse 1, in my Bible, I don't know what it says in yours, but the heading in my Bible is the new heaven and the new earth. And I'll just read the, we're going to read the first four verses, but I'll just uh, start in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The Jews, as you may well know, divided time into two epochs, what they called the present evil age and then the age to come. And whenever it says eternal life in our translations, in the original it says life in the age to come. So it wasn't necessarily a connotation of eternity, although there are prophecies about everlasting kingdoms. Um, and this would appear to be uh, the point at which the transition from the present evil age to the uh, age to come is fully manifested. Um, the old covenant was between God and Israel, or to put it another way, heaven and earth. So when it says uh, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I would take that simply to mean the old covenant is now obsolete. <coughs> of course, there was a, a transition period, as I've referred last week, Malcolm's now and not yet. As soon as Jesus was resurrected, or from the day of Pentecost, the new covenant started, but as yet it's only in partial form. This I would interpret as being where it's fully manifest, where Jesus comes back down and the resurrection takes place. Um, it also says, uh, and the sea was no more. If you think of Genesis 
the start of the creation story, it says uh, the earth was, the sea covered the land, and then God sort of separated the water to allow the uh, dry land to appear. And sea in the, uh, in the Bible and in, in the ancient world in general represents chaos. And the Genesis uh, description is, is talking about order coming out of chaos. And uh, Leviathan, the sea monster, is depicted as sort of whipping up storms of uh, rebellion. And in Revelation itself, the sea represents the pagan nations, particularly Rome. So saying the sea was no more um, would demonstrate that all opposition has ceased. As it said in the passage we looked at in uh, last week in Philippians 2, every knee shall bow. So that's the status, <coughs> status that's now there. Um, every knee bows to Jesus. All enemies um, have been uh, wiped out. And so now, whereas at present, what Tom Wright describes us as being in an overlap, we live in the present evil age, but we also live in the kingdom of God. So we live in an overlap between heaven and earth. But this is describing a complete union between the two, heaven coming down to earth to make one. If we think of Colossians 1, 19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. So through the blood of Jesus, heaven and the earth can now be reconciled and be joined together. If we go on in that passage in, uh, in Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the things have passed away. So it's describing this heaven coming down to earth. And it's revealing that presumably the, the full goal of God's whole plan of redemption was to dwell with mankind. He will dwell with them. Death will be no more. The first things have passed away. And this is actually, in a sense, a restoration of Genesis 1, of the, the Garden of Eden story. You think God creates the cosmos, planet Earth, and on the earth he makes a special place, the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Then he creates Adam and Eve and places them in the garden to act as stewards, to manage it. And then there's this strange uh, passage. Um, it says that when Adam and Eve had sinned, they hear the sound of God walking in the garden and they, they try to hide from it. So God is actually depicted, it doesn't go into any detail, but this uh, <coughs> allusion to God walking in the garden. And so in some sense dwelling. In fact, as much as the Christian world from the, the very beginning has debated various issues of doctrine, the Jewish faith has been no different. And one uh, school of thought within Judaism holds that when God created the cosmos and the earth, he actually created, created it as a place for himself to dwell. So when he finished on the sixth day and saw that it was good, the implication is that he rested, not in heaven, but in the Garden of Eden. May or, or may not be the case. But of course, so there's, in some sense, God is dwelling in Eden. And then, of course, we have, as I just mentioned, the fall. And Adam and Eve are expelled <coughs> from the Garden. Then, in due time... God makes the covenant with Abraham as the means through which he's going to uh, reconcile himself once more with mankind, ultimately by defeating sin and death. And then we get the Exodus, where after four centuries of slavery, Jehovah himself, in the pillar of cloud and fire, leads the people out of slavery, what we call the glory cow. So he doesn't just... Uh, extract them from Egypt, let them go, but he's visibly present with them as they cross the Red Sea, as they wander around the wilderness, and even as they go into the Promised Land and build the, uh, the temple, ultimately, that's all along is the visible presence, the, the, this dwelling aspect of uh, Jehovah with them. And whilst they're in the, 
desert, of course, God makes a new covenant with them of the law. And it's this passage in Leviticus 26 that just describes what that should have looked like if the people had been faithful and lived as God had asked them to live. It's in uh, Leviticus 26, starting in verse 1. It says, If you follow my statutes and keep my commandments and observe them faithfully, I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall overtake the vintage, and the vintage shall overtake the sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and live securely in your land. And I will grant peace in the land, and you shall eat your bread to the full and live securely in your land. And I will grant peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and no one shall make you afraid. I will remove dangerous animals from the land, and no sword shall go through your land. You shall give chase to your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase to a hunt, shall give chase to a hundred, and a hundred of you shall give chase to ten thousand. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will look with favour upon you, and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will maintain my covenant with you. You shall eat old grain long stored, and you shall have to clear out the old to make way for the new. I will place my dwelling in your midst, and I shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be their slaves no more. So here we have a situation, it's not quite Eden, because they have to work, uh, and evidently they have to fight, um, but God is with them and desires to bless them. And just notice that he says, I will place my dwelling in your midst, and then, and I will walk among you. Jews use this phrase about walking with God, like sort of uh, Enoch, um, and it was a, a way of describing the closeness to God. But here, as in Genesis, it's God doing the walking. So again, this desire that God wants to, not just to dwell with his people, but to actively be in relationship with his people. And the, the Hebrew word for dwelling, where it says, I will place my dwelling uh, in your midst, dwelling is uh, mishkan. And the Jews developed the word from mishkan to describe this presence of God in the glory cloud and fire called the Shekinah. And uh, ultimately this resided in the, uh, the Holy of Holies in, in the tabernacle and then when the temple was built uh, in the temple. But of course it didn't work out like God's just described in, uh, in Leviticus 26 because the people weren't faithful and ultimately as Moses had warned they fell to the ultimate uh, punishment, the ultimate curse of exile. And uh, prophet Ezekiel when he's in uh, exile in Babylon, he has this vision that sees this glory cloud departing from the temple. It's in uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 10, verse 4. It says, Then the glory of the Lord rose up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. The house was filled with cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. So God departs from the temple, and then allows the Babylonians to ultimately come in to sack Jerusalem and destroy the temple. But in chapter 40, Ezekiel describes a further vision he has, which sees a new temple being built. And ultimately in chapter 43, in verse 1, the glory cloud returns <coughs> to the new temple. It says uh, Ezekiel 43, verse 1, then he brought me to the gate, the gate facing east, and there the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. The sound was like the sound of mighty waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So the new temple uh, is envisaged in uh, Ezekiel, which is strikingly similar in description to the new temple at the end of uh, Revelation. But of course, when the people are allowed to return to Israel by Cyrus, there's no description of them being led by the glory cloud. 
They rebuild the temple, temple, but when it's inaugurated, there's no description of the glory cloud entering into the Holy of Holies as it had done when Solomon's temple was inaugurated. So although the people have been allowed to return from exile, they knew that essentially they still hadn't been forgiven. They were still being punished for their sin. And so the people longed for a sign that Jehovah was returning to bless them so that all the promises of what life in the age to come, which essentially meant no more enemies, <coughs> Israel being recognised as God's people, no more suffering, a kind of return to that idyllic Eden type uh, existence. And they longed for this to happen and for signs that God was returning uh, to come. Which is why whenever they heard come and see this man, he's the Messiah, they'd be eager to go and listen because Messiah meant the coming of the kingdom, meant the return of Jehovah. So at the time of Jesus, this was still the case. Several centuries had elapsed. There was still no sign of uh, God's presence returning to dwell with his people. Um, and that was demonstrated by the, the presence of the Romans. So now we get to Jesus. So how does Jesus fit into this whole story? Well, I said last week uh, when we looked at John 1.1 1, 1, that John in the, the Logos is describing the eternal and divine nature of Jesus. So he's describing what Jesus is. But then in verse 12, he starts talking about what Jesus becomes. That is in verse 14, but we'll, we'll start in verse 12. So John 1 verse 12, it says, But to all who received him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. So it starts off through Jesus, we have the opportunity to become children of God. We have the opportunity to become something that we are not through Jesus. And how is that achieved? Because Jesus became something he was not. Jesus, the divine and eternal God, became flesh, became man. And because he did that, then we can become children of God. As Tom Wright puts it, God made the garden and then he made man in his image and then to save man, God takes on that very image that he created in order to save mankind. So, the divine eternal word takes flesh and lives among us. And this isn't simply uh, a statement of the incarnation, but it's taken us right back to the story of the Exodus and the dwelling presence of God and the, the Shekinah. Because having evoked Genesis 1 and the creation story in the first few verses um, about the word, John is now evoking uh, the Exodus. If we look at verse 14 again, if it was, uh, Tony and I were talking about paraphrases recently and the word for lived, I think in the NIV it says dwell, but either of those. What it literally says, if the Greek was translated literally, it would say, and the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And that is the word, I don't know how to pronounce Greek, but it looks like skin. It's basically seen with a, a K rather than um, a C. And it's the same word for tent or tabernacle. So you can say, and the word became flesh and pitched his tabernacle. But it's very much invoking the idea of the tabernacling presence of uh, God. And furthermore, John is paralleling um, a statement about the Shekinah from Exodus 40. I'll just read that. Exodus 40, 34 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Let me just uh, explain before I go on about the Tetragrammaton. If any of you are unfamiliar with why our Bibles have 
the word Lord very often in capital letters. Yeah. That's the Tetragrammaton. Basically, in the Hebrew, that's the name of God. And it just says in Hebrew letters Y H W H. And the Jews considered that too holy to say. So when they came to that, they would say instead Adonai, which means Lord. And because there's no vowels, over time, they actually forgot how to pronounce the name of God. And so the best guess is <coughs> Yahweh, but Jehovah was created by taking the vowels from Adonai and inserting them into the Tetragrammaton and making Yahowah or Jehovah um, in English. Well, I just wanted to say that so that when I read, then the, the cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord, that's very explicitly talking about Jehovah. So whenever you read Lord in capital letters, it means Jehovah. So there's no sort of equivocation about who's being talked about here. Then the cloud covered the tent of glory, of tent of meeting, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. So we've got three different elements in that statement. First of all, we've got the physical, visible presence of God, the Shekinah, the glory cloud. Then we've got the revelation of his glory, the glory of Jehovah. And then we've got the dwelling place, the tabernacle. So if we go back to John 1.14, we see those three elements again. The vis physical, visible presence. In Exodus, it's the glory cloud. In John, it's Jesus in the flesh. Then the, the glory. In Exodus, it's the glory of the Lord. In John 1, it's the glory as of a father's only son. And then the dwelling place, in Exodus, it's the tabernacle. In John 1, it's uh, pitching his tent among us, dwelling within the community of the people. So John isn't simply saying that Jesus is divine, but he's paralleling Jesus' presence with that of Jehovah in the cloud of glory, leading his people from slavery. And when he says, we have seen his glory, he's probably referring to the transfiguration. Because, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll go into it, but John doesn't generally detail anything in his gospel that's in the synoptic gospels, because his was written sometime after them, so he seems to assume that any Christians will be familiar with the other gospels. Um, but we'll just look at um, Matthew's account uh, of the transfiguration and uh, it really becomes clear why that's probably what John was referring to. So Matthew 17 verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So you see all the, the elements there, Jesus dazzling in a sort of un, uh, an abnormal nature, a kind of leaking of his divine being, uh, the, uh, the cloud, God speaking from the cloud, uh, and even Peter bringing in the, the tents. Um, and I always thought that was a bizarre thing. Wow. What on earth was Peter thinking of? Right? What was he on about? But when you consider the, the history, and especially the, one of the major feasts, one of the three major feasts was called the Feast of the Tabernacles. Yeah. And they celebrated God's abiding presence during the Exodus and the wilderness years by going to Jerusalem and making little shelters that they would live in as a family through the duration of the feast. So Peter seems to have all these things in mind right. and he's moved by what happens to want to, to construct uh, something similar. And then John goes on in verse 18, chapter 1 verse 18. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. So John is now taking Jesus' presence even beyond that of God in the glory cloud because despite all the symbol 
uh, or the powerful symbolism of the, the glory cloud when it meant to the, the Jews, John is saying no one has ever seen God. So yes, God was present in the glory cloud, but it wasn't the essence of God. But in Jesus the Son, you actually see the character of God displayed. If you see Jesus, you see God. And then if we go on to uh, the story of John the Baptist, picking it up in verse 22, John 1 verse 22. <coughs> so this is uh, John the Baptist being interrogated. And they say, they th Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So John the Baptist is identifying who he is and what he's doing by quoting from Isaiah. Let's just look at that passage. It's Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way... I'm going to read, I'm going to say Jehovah, where it says Lord, just to make it explicit. In the wilderness prepare the way of Jehovah. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of Jehovah shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of Jehovah has spoken. So this is a passage in Isaiah about preparing the way for Jehovah and the glory of Jehovah being revealed. And John quotes that to explain what he was doing. And yet it was Jesus that John the Baptist was preparing the way for. Hmm. In addition, the synoptics, that's all that John quotes, but in the same um, incident, uh, the synoptics all quote a passage from Malachi. This is Malachi 3, verse 1. It says, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord, in this case Adonai, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight indeed, he is coming, says Jehovah of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? So here again is a, a passage explicitly about Jehovah returning to his temple. And yet Matthew in 11, chapter 11 verse 10 um, depicts Jesus quoting this to describe what John the Baptist is doing. Jesus says, This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus himself is identifying <coughs> this passage to explain what he's doing. A passage that talks about Jehovah returning to his temple. John is clearly the messenger. And note it says, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Whose temple is it? It's Jehovah's temple. It was built for, it was built for him to dwell in, for the glorious cloud to reside in. And yet Jesus is saying that's talking about him journeying to uh, Jerusalem to fulfil his role. This is when I said last week that things kept on making me ask the question, your God is too small, referring to Jesus. It was passages like these again and again, Old Testament passages explicitly about Jehovah being fulfilled in, uh, in Jesus. So, not only is uh, John describing here the nature of Jesus' divinity, but he's also implying by all this Exodus uh, parallels that Jesus is, is here as well in order to lead his, lead his people out of slavery. But obviously, as the Gospels make clear, slavery to sin and death rather than slavery in Egypt. In Matthew 1, where we started, Matthew uses the, uh, the title, the name from Isaiah, Emmanuel, God with us. So that's right at the start of his Gospel. And then, literally closing passage we all know very well, Matthew 28, uh, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, 
I am always with you to the end of the age. When I talked about dwelling earlier and that he pitched his tent, because it's a tent, that has an implication of temporary dwelling. And here, of course, that temporary dwelling is coming to an end because Jesus is about to uh, ascend. And yet, he closes at the point of his departure by saying, I am with you always. So, he's going in bodily form, but he's talking now about an ongoing dwelling, the indwelling spirit, that will endure until the, uh, the passage in, we started with in uh, Revelation 21 is fulfilled. And all authority in heaven on earth, that leads us on to uh, what we were singing about tonight, about Jesus as King, and also where it talks about all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, presumably given to me implies from uh, Jehovah, and that also takes us on to the following class, which will be um, on the Son of Man. Uh, although before that, in two weeks' time, we've got the uh, devotional. So that's it um, for tonight, and uh, we'll take it up with the King next time. Thank you.